The original document. On the bottom right, will you read for me the last the, the statement there starting with de defects identified? Defects identified by CMS being treated as critical target fixes for 912. And that is, in fact, what you testified for, to it, right? Yes. That you had found defects? Yes. And as you read up from that box, uh, yes. you found that there were defects, that you decided to disable the shopper function and focus instead on plan compare? Correct. Right. Why did you do that? Because uh, if given um, the opportunity to choose a more critical function, plan compare um, is much more critical in the path of a consumer being able to enroll in health care as compared to the ability to uh, browse. Okay. And so you thought that that was the best priority and you focused attention on that? At that time, yes, given the um, CGI resources that were available. And, um, and actually, there was a subsequent date, I think, uh, I would have to locate the documentation. Post, we did do another round of testing post 912, and it was still failing. So. Um, and so you disagree with CGI. They thought it tested successfully, and you instead had this ongoing belief that it had tested unsuccessfully. There were defects, and that's why you made the decision to switch your priorities to the other. Correct, because the, the report that I look at is from the ACA independent testers, not from CGI. Okay. And, and in fact, that's why uh, the, the shopper function was disabled, correct? Right? Correct, based and on the report from the independent testers. So when Chairman Issa stated on national television that the White House ordered you as CMS to disable the shopper function in September for political reasons to avoid consumer sticker shock, that is not true, is it? I object. The gentleman, the gentleman, sir, the gentleman, the may, the, not, is, the gentleman may not mischaracterize my statement. The gentleman may not object in the middle of somebody else's questioning. Uh, you, Your question is going to the chair, which you don't point, currently but, occupy, and I'll continue Mr. my question. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Point, of, point of privilege. The gentleman is recognized. The gentleman is repeatedly disparaging and mischaracterizing what I have said. Could the chair please direct all members, if they want to allege a quote, ensure that it is a quote and not, in fact, a characterization that is inaccurate as the gentleman's is? The chair would remind each uh, and every member here to direct their comments. And, and without personality and, and directing those comments to make sure that they are reflected as to not make a personal attack. Well, that is well said. I don't know of any personal attacks, so I assume you are directing that to somebody else. But I will read a, a quote on October 27 from Chairman Eisner on national television. Here it is in quote, Contractors have already told us that, in fact, people represented, represented that the White House was telling them they needed these changes, including instead of a simple he quoted, let me shop for a program, then decide to register, close quite, quote, they were forced to register and go through all the things that they have slowed down in the website before they could find out about a price. The contractors the Chairman referred to were CGI, but CGI officials have denied ever saying such a thing. And nevertheless, he went on to claim on the White House, and I quote, bury the information about the high cost of Obamacare, close quote, in order to avoid consumer, open quote, sticker shock, close quote. And that is not why you made the decision to disable that program of an anonymous shopper, is it, Mr. Chow? Just as I answered before, absolutely not. Thank you. I yield back. No. I, I yield to my colleague, Mr. I just want to address this to uh, Chairman Issa. Uh, when speaking to Mr. Connolly earlier, you referred to a letter sent to you on November 6. It is not a letter I sent jointly with Mr. Connolly, so he did not read that letter. The, that letter was about MITRE security testing documents provided to the committee. A MITRE told us that, like any website security documents, they are sensitive and their release potentially could give hackers hints on how to break into the system. So I ask you to treat those documents with sensitivity, to consult with me before making them public. You tried to use my letter to argue that the system is not secure, but that is not what I said. Every security testing document for every IT system, no matter how secure the system is, is sensitive. Every security testing document could give ill-meaning individuals help in causing mischief. These documents do not mean there are problems with the security of the system. I just wanted to clear that up, and I yield back. I yield back as well. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, and, Mr. Mr. Chow, uh, I know that you have made a number of comments with regards to your sworn testimony and, and what you recall or don't. And, and I would make it available to you, you know, for your reference there at, at uh, the desk if you would like to have that in case there are other questions that are, that are asked regarding that. 
Thank you, but um, I probably would need some time to go over what looks like. So you need time to review what you've said previously on the record? It was nine hours' worth of uh, interview questions. Okay. As soon as the hearing is over, if you would like to come back and review this, we will be glad to uh, make it available to you. And with that, I recognize the gentleman from uh, Tennessee, Mr. Desiree. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, welcome. I know that the hearing is getting long and there has been a lot of questions going on, but there is there's no, no doubt that the American people want some answers about this huge investment in a rollout of a website that certainly didn't go as planned. I mean, it has been a learning experience. It has been an educational experience. Uh, Mr. Park, looking back, knowing what you know now, looking at the rollout in October, give a letter grade to the rollout of Obamacare, A through F. Um, that's a that's an interesting question. Uh, in terms of the role of the website, uh, uh, you know, it's uh, obviously been uh, really really rocky. Uh, I kind of hesitate to assign a letter grade to it, but it's what nobody wanted. Well, obviously. I think the people that appreciate honesty. I mean, you, you don't you don't have to fail it, but uh, what do you think it was? A through F. I think it depends on the user, right? There were some users able to get through, and there are other users, a lot of users who couldn't. Uh, so, okay, so you're not going to give it a grade. I, I think it, I think that kind of overly simplifies it. Well, maybe, so. maybe, but you know, a lot of people want uh, watching you know, want answers, and this is a complex issue, and, and so just maybe for simplification, they'd like to know that a lot of people who are responsible for rolling this out don't think that it went very well. You, to, to listen to this hearing, uh, you know, it, it doesn't really sound like. A lot of you think it was that uh, abysmal of a failure. This hearing started out with uh, the ranking member talking about how this is a Republican issue, how we are out to destroy health care or the health care law, how we are trying to repeal it, how we are trying to uh, you know, not have this hearing to see if we can make, th make this succeed. Bottom line is a lot of money was invested in this and, and people do want answers. So it is complex, but yet in a simple fashion, I think people would like to hear that, you know, hey, uh, we screwed up. Uh, Mr. Chow, can you give it a letter grade? I agree with Todd that uh, it's highly subjective. Okay, so fair enough. I, I, does will anybody give? Would the gentleman uh, yield? Yeah, to, Mr. Chairman, could, perhaps we could have it as a pass fail. Okay, a little less subjective. Oh, that, yeah, that would be that'd be less complicated. Do you give it a pass or a fail, Mr. Park? Um, again, I, I don't want to reduce it uh, to uh, something that. Um, boiled down. What I would say is, just to be clear, just to be clear, uh, all of us are frustrated about how the site rolled out. None of us think it went well. Uh, all of us think it was incredibly rocky, and we are incredibly focused on trying to fix it and make it better, and it's getting better week after week after week. Okay. So knowing what we know now, uh, Mr. Chow, <clears throat> you testified that you were given your marching orders, but yet I, I don't think the October 1st date was immovable. Would you agree with that? I don't have the luxury of determining what date is movable and not movable. I was given October 1st as a delivery date, and that's what I targeted. Knowing what you know now, would you have pushed harder to have the date move back? That's pure speculation. At the time, how can it be it speculation? You know what you know now. Because I wasn't in a position to choose a date. I'm asking today, sitting here today, testifying in front of this committee, knowing what you know now, would you have pushed harder to move the date back? I go by what I said. I so you would let history repeat itself. It's been a rocky, Mr. That's Park. Not what I said. Would you have? Would you have? That is um, not what I said. Okay, Mr. Park. Would you, knowing what you know now, ask to have this delayed or pushed back? Uh, I don't actually have a really detailed uh, uh, knowledge base of what actually uh, happened uh, pre-October one. I don't know what levers were available, so on and so forth. So I just hesitate to uh, make any pronouncements. Okay. So once again, we, we spent over half a billion of taxpayer money, and no one who is responsible for the rollout is willing to say that uh, we should have done things differently. I mean, the, the President doesn't know it, but first of all, we were trying to save the American people from a bad law by all that we just went through over the past few months. And really, we were trying to save the President from himself. He needed to sit down and talk with us about delaying this, and, and nobody sitting on this panel, after seeing what a failure this has been over the past month, is willing to step up and say, yes, we should have delayed this. Is that, is that what I'm hearing? I didn't give everyone a chance. Does anyone want to speak to that? 
Perhaps the GAO could comment on whether or not this was a site that, in retrospect, should have been launched on October 1st and serviced that full six people while millions of people were unable to get through? Clearly, knowing what we know now, you know, a delay in rollout would have made sense. But the thing is, I don't know what we are not privy to who knew what when in terms of the test results and all that kind of stuff. That is where we don't have insights into that. I'm okay. Well, a lot of these the regulations, fact, Mr. Chow, were, were delayed until after the election. Do you have any reason why a lot of the regulations that probably caused a lot of these problems were delayed until after the election? The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman may answer. I don't, um, I don't have um, the scope. Uh, it is not within my scope to co cover like, when regulations get released or not. Does anyone know? Mr. Park, you were Chief Technology. Mr. Van Roko, oh, you know, your, your organization owned the question of whether or not in a timely fashion these regulations were created. No, that is that's actually a mischaracterization of my organization's role. We and, and my team are tech policy people, not health policy people related to regulations. No, but not. whether the trains run on time, whether they get, whether things implementing laws, isn't that what OMB does? Uh, my, my role in OMB is to set government-wide policy, to look at government-wide oh, okay. of the so, budget. And to so we should get the OMB director in here and find out why, after three and a half years, the things weren't done so that this could be launched for the American people in a timely fashion. I guess we get a couple of OMB directors. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Missouri owns five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for attempting to get answers to your questions on uh, healthcare.gov. Gov. And my questions today will focus on the Federal contract between CMS to CGI Federal uh, to set up healthcare.gov. If any other witnesses, in, including Mr. Pounder, Pounder, care to comment on my question, please feel free to jump in. Mr. Chow, in your testimony today, you stated that CMS contracted with CGI Federal to build a federally facilitated marketplace system, including the elig eligibility and enrollment system. According to the Washington Post, this contract is worth $93.7 million. How much money from this contract has already been awarded to CGI? I don't have the exact figures. Uh, what incentives and disincentives were in the contract for CGI Federal to successfully fulfill their contract to roll out healthcare.gov? I think as with uh, at the starting at the highest level, the Federal Acquisition Regulation um, has uh, very specific guidance about um, contracting and, and the contracting framework in which you would then award IT contracts with specifications for uh, something like the marketplace. And they are still working on the website, CGI? Yes. Federal? Yes. And they have been paid how much to this point? I don't have the exact figures in front of me. Uh, and are you pleased with the product you received from CGI Federal? I think the, uh, as Todd mentioned, we are all... Um, you know, not, look, look, we have a responsibility as an oversight committee. And that's to protect taxpayer dollars, and so I'm asking specific questions about the taxpayers' dollars. Perhaps Mr. Pounder can share shed some light on this. Have we paid CGI Federal yet? I don't know specifically what went to CGI. We do know that the government has paid IT funding over six hundred million dollars. So how, that's what we how, okay. do know. Okay, tell me about the structure of the contract then. Uh, if they perform, then they should get paid, correctly? I think how this contract is um, formulated is that uh, there is a performance um, uh, element of it. So there is a based uh, set of costs and uh, that are factored into performing the work. Um, and then uh, in, during certain review periods, uh, they could receive a, a performance uh, you know, kind of incentive. But I would have to get back to you on exactly how that works, because I don't run the contracts. Yeah, would you share with this, this committee uh, how they are going to be paid how, uh, for the work performed already? I mean, are they still working on healthcare.gov and, you know, in the 
since they messed it up in the first place, are they still on it? They are the contractor that does the development as well as ongoing operations and maintenance. So, they, yes, they are still working on it. Uh, Mr. Mr. Powell, can you shed some light on this? Yeah, I would just like to uh, say that, uh, you know, we can sit here and talk about contractor fault, government fault. Government's at fault here, too, on the requirements point of view. I mean, it's clear that from a requirements perspective, there's fault on the government side. Congressman Clay, we went through this with the Census Bureau with the handheld, mm -hmm. same situation, right? Same I mean, situation. Same situation. There are but we corrected it. Ill-defined requirements, we overspent, we went, came in and fixed it, but it is the same situation. Okay. Ill-defined requirements, questions about, there are all kinds of questions across the board. Fault. Okay. I have been told that this was simply lazy Federal contracting. What are the failures? Uh, of CMS in policing the, C the CGI contract to ensure that the rollout of healthcare.gov would be a success. What are the failures? Can well, anybody tell me? I would say, sir, I'm going to go of back the oversight to, go back of to CMS. Executive oversight. I think there is a fundamental question. I mean, there is to be investment boards in place at these agencies and departments. The questions are, what meetings occurred, who attended, what risks were discussed, what follow-up occurred, how timely were those meetings. That, that's really what you need to look at. Well, right? and from a taxpayer perspective, these are millions of dollars going to a failed product. I don't think they are happy. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Uh, I don't have time. I would ask you to oh, consent yeah. the ranking member have 30 seconds. I'll the gentleman is recognized. No, I just uh, I, I thought you had time. I'm sorry, um, Mr. Uh, Park. We've had a lot of bad news in this hearing. Can you just again tell us where we are and the progress we're making? You're making. It's the progress that the team is making. I'm just a small part of the team, uh, but the team's working really hard to, to to make progress week after week. Just some numbers, which are always helpful, right? Uh, as I mentioned previously, the average system response time, uh, which is the, the time it takes, say, a page to render or a request to be fulfilled of a user, uh, was eight seconds on average a few weeks ago. It is now under a second. Uh, another measure is the system error rate, which is the rate at which you experience errors uh, in the, uh, uh, the marketplace application. And that was over 6 percent uh, a few weeks ago. Now it is actually uh, about 1 percent uh, and actually getting lower than that. So really good progress. Still much, much work to do. Uh, a lot of work to do, uh, but uh, there is a, a system and a pattern of attack in place, as I mentioned earlier, around monitoring, production stability work, uh, functional bug fixing, and improving the release the, process. Would the ranking member yield? Yeah. Would the yeah. ranking member yield? Uh, the chairman, will, ye the ch would the chairman will yield to the gentleman from Missouri Thank briefly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Park, um, what contractors are working on fixing the site? Is it CGI one of them, CGI Federal? CGI is one. Uh, and uh, CMS, of course, is the uh, manager of all the contracts. They can give you the most comprehensive answer. But CGI is one, yes. Okay, thank you. I thank all of you. And, and Mr. Park, in case it isn't said again in this hearing, we believe that what you are doing today is important. I think what GAO has said is there wasn't a single point of contact, a, a, an expert in charge in a timely fashion that would be accountable and coordinate, that would, if you will, sleep on their floor, if that's what it took, before October 1st. So that's the big reason we're here today. But I think that's where GAO is making the point to all of us that the next time there's one of these, we need to have somebody, perhaps not of your stature, but as close as we can come. Uh, there in the months and years preceding it. We now go to the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Gowdy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Park, do you agree that there is a difference between an innocent misstatement of a perceived fact and a deliberate attempt to deceive? Yes. So do I. When did you first realize that you couldn't keep your health insurance, even if you did like it, period? Um, so, again, that is kind of a uh, health policy matter. It is really outside my lane. So uh, You don't know when you first realized that you couldn't keep your health insurance, even if you liked it, period? 
Uh, I don't recall, no. Would you agree with me that credibility or the lack thereof in one area of life can impact credibility or the lack thereof in another area of life? Uh, I suppose it could. In your written testimony, you wrote, as you know, October 1st was the launch date of the new website, healthcare.gov. And I did know that. I just didn't know why. And, and, and I'm going to read to you a quote from Secretary Sebelius. Uh, she said, uh, and I'll paraphrase it initially, that she was hurried into producing a website by October the 1st because the law required it. Now, I'll read you the direct quote. In an ideal world, there would have been a lot more testing. We did not have the luxury of that with a law that said it's go time on October the 1st. Uh, Mr. Park, I don't know what ideal world she's referring to, so I'm just going to stick with the one we're in. What law was she referencing? What law required this website to launch on October the 1st? Uh, I can't really speak for Secretary Sebelius. I'm not asking you to speak for her. I'm asking you, what law was she referring to? Is there a law that required this website to launch on October the 1st? Um, again, I, and that's a health policy and legal matter. That's not really my... It's actually a legal question. Do you know if there's a law that requires this website to launch on October the 1st, or do you know whether it was just an arbitrary date that the administration settled on? Uh, I actually do not. W would you find that to be important, whether or not we really had to go October the 1st, given the fact that we weren't ready to go on October the 1st? Would you find that relevant, whether or not we actually had to launch a substandard product? Um, sir, I respectfully, I'm just a technology guy trying to... Don't decide. short, don't, don't, don't short yourself. You're the smartest one in the room. Well, that's not true, sir. <laughs> Trust me, I've been in this room for a while. It is true. <laughs> There is no law that requires that. So what Secretary Sebelius said was patently false. There is no law that required a go time on October the 1st. But I want to move to another component of her quote. Some of us don't consider texting, uh, testing to be a luxury. Uh, but let's assume, arguendo, that she's right, that, that additional testing would have been a luxury that would have been nice to have. How much more testing would you have done prior to launching? So I'm not uh, deeply familiar with uh, the uh, development testing regimen that happened prior to October 1, so I um, can't really opine about that. Well, let me ask you this. Be because you are the smartest one in the room. I'm not, sir. And very good at what you do, where in the heck were you for the first 184 weeks? If you're being asked to fix this after October the 1st, in a couple of weeks, where were you for the first 184 after the so-called Affordable Care Act passed? Where did they have you hidden? Uh, so, sir, uh, uh, in my role at the White House as USCTO in the Office of Science and Technology Policy, I am a technology and innovation policy advisor, so I have a broad portfolio of responsibilities. But you are obviously good enough that they brought you in to fix what was broken. It has been called a train wreck. That's not fair to train wrecks. It's been called other things. They brought you in to fix it. Why didn't they bring you in to start it? Why didn't they bring you in to build it? Uh, so why, I'm part why are you doing a reclamation project? Why didn't you build it? Uh, I'm part of an all-hands-on-deck effort that's been mobilized across the administration to actually help under Jeff Science's leadership. Um, and uh, uh, in the uh, lead-up to October 1, uh, that uh, wasn't part of my role. I was. When will it be uh, operational to your satisfaction? Well, we have a goal that the team is pursuing uh, with tremendous intensity. How many more weeks? Because I'm going to get asked when I go home. I know you can appreciate that. I'm going to get asked. When will it be operational? When will it be as good as it can get? Because you'll concede the first 184 weeks did not go swimmingly. Is it going to be another 184 weeks? Um, so, sir, I think the, the honest answer is that uh, there's, a, there's a team of incredibly dedicated public servants. I get all that. I'm looking for a hard. number. I'm looking for a number. We can interpret the poem later. I'm looking for a number. Uh, that's working hard to have the site functioning by the end of this month. 
uh, smoothly for the vast majority of Americans. That's, that's the, the goal. The, the gentleman's time has expired. I might stipulate for the record that Mr. Park was at HHS at the time of passage and for that roughly first two years. So his expertise does come out of the origins of uh, Obamacare. Well, my, my question, Mr. Chairman, was simply if he is good enough to be brought in to fix it after the locomotive has crashed off the mountainside, where in the hell was he for the first 184 weeks when it was being broken? Well, why wait until it's crashed? If he's, a, if he's a savant, and I'm convinced he is, where's he been? I know the Obama girl is missing, but, but he wasn't. I think they found her, actually, the, the lady from the website. I think they found her. But where's he been? Time's up. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, we now go to the gentleman from Texas. Uh, would the gentleman yield for just 10 seconds? Certainly. I want to make a, a statement, and Mr. Gowdy, you are right on that they should have had the A team on this, and some of the people here today clearly were there for the train wreck. I want to note that Mr. Park's, Park's, Park's possessive uh, duties did not include overseeing this website. Uh, and I do appreciate the fact that in, it appears as though in 60 days they are going to make right what wasn't ready on October 1st. And I think that's what the gentleman wants to be able to explain back home, is that we have been told that November 30th, this will work reasonably well. In other words, a 60-day delay or less could have allowed this uh, to be launched in a timely fashion. I think the gentleman yeah, uh, asked his full time be restored. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and and I, I do want to follow up on that, Mr. Park. You say a vast, there are a lot of hedge words in there, vast majority of um, Americans mostly working. All right, am I going to be able to go to the IRS and, said, uh, and say it didn't work for me, I couldn't get my insurance, I'm not going to be fined? I mean, you've you got to tell us it's, when it's going to be in, in good shape. Can you give us a date? Is, is the end of the month realistic? Uh, the team is working really hard to hit that goal, and that's what I'm able to say right now. Sir. So, so you, you, to, to me, that, as a former web developer, that's what I was telling clients when we were going to miss a deadline. We're working real hard to, to meet it. So, and I, I am a former web developer. I have a little, you know, certainly nothing to this scape, but with $600 million, I probably could have put together a team to, to do it and, and, and do a better job. But I'm not going to really throw uh, uh, the contractor under the bus. I mean, I think it's too much money. I think it's a lot, lot of issues there. But one of the biggest struggles we had when we were developing websites was getting stuff from the client, whether it was their copy uh, for the text of the website or whether it was the specifications. You know, the copy we could change pretty quick. We could just cut and paste it out of the email into, a, into an HTML editor or content manager. But when the actual specifications for how it uh, goes, change up to the last minute, uh, it, it, it's very difficult to do. Mr. Shaw, how late were there substantial changes being ordered uh, to the website? Do you have a time frame, how, for, how long before that October 1st launch? I don't think there were any um, substantial changes ordered. Um, it was more a, um, a standard practice of looking at how much time you have left, um, uh, watching your schedule very quickly. Closely and then figuring out which corners the to scope, cut. Right, and the priorities that are set by the business. All right, I, I want to follow up on a couple of questions that some other folks answered, that asked that I didn't think get, got completely answered. Mr. Jordan asked you, Mr. Chow, uh, uh, if it was uh, thoroughly tested. And uh, you said, yes, it was thoroughly tested. Mr. Jordan didn't ask the next follow-up question. Uh, how did it do on those tests? Did it pass? I think what I was, if I said thoroughly, I, I apologize. I, now maybe I, you said it was tested. It was tested under the prescribed, you know, we were talking about security testing, so I was saying that it was tested under the prescribed okay. security controls. And let me follow up on, with Mr. Park on something Mr. Langford asked. He was concerned about uh, either members of your team or uh, other folks having access to sensitive data. And on those days you were sleeping on the floor, could you have walked into a server with a thumb drive and walked out with people's personal information like Mr. Snowden? I mean, is there, are, are those security risks there? Uh, uh, no, I could have not, no. Okay. Well, that, that's a little bit reassuring. Let me uh, also ask Mr. Uh, Chow or Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Pounder, 
With respect to the private sector, if there is a data breach or a compromise, uh, your credit card information or your personal information gets released, there is a Federal law requiring notice. I just got a notice from a major software company that my credit card had been uh, compromised. Uh, is, will, we, will we find out if our information on healthcare.gov is compromised? Is there a notice requirement? Is there something in place where we will know if that information has been hacked in this public? Yes, there are actually several laws and rules that apply, like particularly with disclosing any incident or breach that involves a person's. Okay, so there are no special exemptions in Obamacare under that. We will hopefully find out. Again, I'm just concerned. We're at an issue at a time right now where the trust in government has never been lower. We have the whole uh, NSA Snowden incident. We have the IRS looking at people for political purposes. So, you know, I. I You'll excuse me if I'm, I'm concerned that we've got a massive website that's a target for hackers that a lot of people have information to that, by definition, reaches out and touches the IRS and Social Security computers. Whenever you connect computers together, you open pathways to hackers. So, you know, I'm I, I'm very concerned about the security issues. I just want to make sure we're going to know if there's some problems and they're not going to be swept under the rug for political purposes. No, I do. I we work closely with Frank Bateman's uh, security uh, operations at the department level, as well as uh, an extensive uh, computer. All right, and then finally, Mr. Chow, you asked, or you, you stated earlier in your testimony that the uh, the anonymous shopping feature, which I would love to see, I don't think it's even in place now, yeah, but uh, it was disabled, uh, you know, before the election. Uh, and you know we, we can talk about political purposes or not. Uh, I think, you the, said I think, it the, think work. the gentleman is saying before the October right. first launch. Yeah, was, before the October. Yes. So it was it was deleted. But why wasn't the October first deadline uh, pushed back? Because it didn't work. I mean, why wasn't the whole thing delayed? When you delayed the anonymous shopping part, the part we'd all mo feel most safe about, uh, going finding out how much it'll cost without revealing personal information, you delayed it for that. Why didn't you delay the whole thing when you knew it wasn't going to work? I think anonymous shopper was a very narrow slice of, of looking at uh, what the trade-offs would be in putting something into production as opposed to now, again with my again I'm sorry I'm out of time but I do want to say with my lack of trust in the federal government now I'm I'm loathe to put my personal information in and would love to shop anonymously just like I did on some of the private exchanges in Texas as I look for what I'm going to do about my personal health care uh, I I don't think you have to give up your personal information to get prices for something. You don't have to do it on airline websites, you don't have to do it on Amazon, and you shouldn't have to do it on healthcare.gov. And I will yield back. I thank the gentleman. Is the gentlelady from New Mexico prepared to go? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, I believe so. You are recognized. Well, thank you very thank much. Thank you for coming Mr. back. Well, absolutely. Thank you. And actually, uh, before I start, I realized I, I wasn't here for this uh, statement, but I want to um, echo what my colleague, uh, Congressman Langford, said about gaps in coverage. Uh, and coming from a State with uh, more than, you know, uh, nearly 25 percent uninsured, two things have occurred. One, people who, as of October 1st, couldn't get on the website and are continuing to follow uh, this issue very closely, their individual or family plans expired or were expiring, and so they went off the exchange because they can't get on and uh, purchased brand new policies for another year. And unlike the small businesses, they are in that now for a year, and they are paying much higher rates than they would have could they have gotten on the individual exchange, because New Mexico is a partnership state. And then second, as December 15th looms ever uh, closer, uh, we know that that is another important deadline for many individual plans, and we have the same issue. And I am very concerned about that, and I appreciate that it was brought up. Uh, and I've, so I have told you about what we are uh, uh, working through and uh, that we, we have been fighting for a long time in New Mexico to find ways to have uh, access to affordable coverage. Uh, and so we, I need, we need, my constituents need this website to work. They need to enroll in exchange. And I know that you have heard all day long that we are all frustrated. They are frustrated. I am frustrated. And while I wish that we had better solutions for them earlier on, my biggest concern is that we are reaching a critical point in the implementation timeline. In order to ensure 
then that there is no gap in coverage between plan years, individuals and families who would like to choose a plan from the exchanges, as I said earlier in my remarks, have to be enrolled by December 15. Your stated goal of fixing the website uh, by the end of this November leaves very little room for error. And I know it is not easy. But while you are here, I just want to make sure that, for the record, we are emphasizing that there is real urgency here. Um, Mr. Park, I think that you have a deep appreciation uh, for how transformative good technology can be. But I would like to know if this is a time constraint that you are aware of. And also, more broadly, if you feel the same urgency that I do about, to get, about getting the site operational for as many users as possible. Absolutely. All right. Then I can imagine that leaving your office for at least an entire day would have pretty important impacts on your work fixing the website. What would you be doing if you weren't here today? I, I would be working with, with the team on the site. So, Mr. Park, yeah, I wish that you were working on healthcare.gov on the website right now. And part of this committee's job is to ensure that you have all the tools and resources that you need to do your job. What else can we do to assist you to get this done? Well, again, I am a small part of a, of a broad team uh, that is working incredibly hard, uh, led by Administrator Tavener and Jeff Science uh, and the CMS team. Um, I would say just as one member of the team, if you could just be responsive to them uh, and their requests for assistance, that would be terrific. Uh, great. We, uh, I think we are going to need more clarity about that. And I also agree with this committee's effort to talk about uh, reforming IT procurement. I don't know if today is the day to try to deal with those best practices. And given that uh, states do it poorly and the Federal Government is doing it poorly and that we have spent uh, millions, uh, I guess if you did a whole country analysis, billions of dollars on IT projects that uh, uh, haven't gone well anywhere in the public <laughs> sector. We, we have to figure out a better way to do that. And I hope that this committee will continue to lead that effort in a bipartisan way. But I want to go back to the, the situation that we are in. I want to be results oriented. And I want to solve these problems. And I feel like we shouldn't be pulling a surgeon from the operating room today. So thank you, Mr. Parks. I yield back. Just make, make one more statement, ma'am, if that is OK. I just want you to yield. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yes. So, Would you yield? I do. I'm oh, sorry. So I just wanted to um, actually not lose the, the second to last thread that you started, um, which was IT procurement. Uh, I think it's a phenomenally important issue. I think this committee has done terrific work on it. I think we actually need to do more. Uh, and so would love to see a uh, high energy bipartisan effort um, uh, attacking this issue from multiple dimensions. Um, I know less about it uh, than many people on this committee. What I do know is that there is not a single silver bullet. Uh, there are decades of practices and rules and laws that have actually led to where we are now. Uh, but I think with a concerted effort, high energy effort, bipartisan effort, we can actually take this out uh, and uh, 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 deliver better, faster, uh, uh, higher return results to the American people. Uh, I ask unanimous consent the gentlelady have an additional 30 seconds without objection so ordered, and will you yield to the ranking member? Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Gentleman is right. I am going to just get to the bottom line here real quick. You know, what will happen uh, is that people will are sitting there, and I, I, go back, I agree with the gentlelady. We are looking at results. When we go back to what happened with Langford, and he was trying to get on the page, Mr. Park, and he couldn't get there, talk, can you talk about that for a minute? Um, you know, because that's that's real, and so we, you know, and there are probably people sitting w watching us right now who are trying to get on the page. And can you kind of tell us what you are doing and how that affects things like that? Because you know they've got reporters now that sit on telecasts and they say, "Oh, I waited an hour, and I waited two hours, I waited an hour." You know, so tell us how that relates to what you're doing so that our constituents can have some kind of assurances that things are going to get better. Uh, if, if, if you follow me? Right. Absolutely, sir. Thank you for the question. Uh, and I will just answer quickly because I know we have limited time. So one, uh, there have been dramatic improvements in the ability to, uh, as a consumer, uh, create an account and get onto the site uh, and all the metrics that we are seeing. And that has been a function of basically uh, improving the ability of uh, that part of the site to handle volume through capacity expansion and software work, and also fixing bugs. 
Um, so many, many, many more people are able to actually get through now than at the beginning. Uh, that being said, it's, it's not perfect yet. Uh, so I actually would really love to follow up with uh, the Congressman to actually understand his specific use case and dial that back uh, into the work of the team. Also, uh, there are folks uh, who uh, early on got caught uh, in the middle of that cycle uh, and are stuck there. And those are folks that CMS is now reaching out to, as we talked about earlier uh, in the hearing, to actually get them through the process cleanly. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's an issue that actually I think uh, has been in very large part addressed, but there's still more work to do. And I, I do want to follow up with uh, the Congressman uh, to understand the specific use case he's in and his situation so we can, we can figure that out. I thank you. Uh, now as we go to Mr. Massey, who from a standpoint of his education and, and known IQ could in fact rival you as the smartest guy in the room. Well, I'm, I'm sure he exceeds me. No, I, I'm from the trade school that's a mile down the river from your art school that you attended. Um, in any case, we both share an affinity. You, you better share that with, uh, with the rest of the world. Okay. I went to MIT. You went to Harvard. Uh, you definitely kicked my butt, sir. <laughs> um, and maybe we can uh, share some numbers later. I'm sure we share an affinity for numbers. Uh, but first, I want to talk about the, the final security control assessment that was prepared by MITRE and just read a little bit of that. It says, MITRE was unable to, to adequately test the confidentiality and integrity of the HIX system in full. The majority of MITRE's testing efforts were focused on testing the expected functionality of the application. Complete end-to-end -end testing of the application never occurred. So this was MITRE's final security control assessment. And we're, we're throwing around a lot of uh, three-letter acronyms, HIX, CMX, or CMS, ATO, but I've got a document that's got CYA written all over it here, Mr. Chow. You wrote a, a letter, and this is the final ATO or authority to operate to Maryland Tavern, which she signed off on. And in this letter that you stated, due to system readiness issues, the SCA, and that's Security Control Assessment, was only partly completed. This constitutes a risk that must be accepted and mitigated to support the marketplace day one operations. In this sentence here, and this was written on September 27th, or certainly signed off on September 27th, were you trying to tell your boss that there is a risk and I am not going to accept it, that you must accept this risk? We can either delay the date or we can accept the security risk. I think I was outlining a more of a generalized um, risk acceptance with a uh, fairly significant rollout of the marketplace systems. But, but that risk existed because there had never been an end-to-end -end security test on this. Is that true? I mean, that's basically what the letter states here. I think in previous testimony, I've also said that end-to-end -end is a highly subjective term. Well, if it's subjective, how are you going to get it done in 60 to 90 days? It all what is it that's it going to happen? It all depends on the scope of what you are trying to put in production. Well, the scope is, uh, is our data safe? Is the, is the personal information that Americans enter into this system going to be safe? For instance, in this same letter, it is a very short letter, signed by Marilyn Tavern on September 27th, you suggested that we conduct a full security control assessment, so I will let you define what that is, in a stable environment, which implies that you don't have a stable environment right now where all security controls can be tested within 60 to 90 days of going live on October 1st. Here is what troubles me about this letter. You are basically saying, look, we can go live, but there is going to be security risks, but let's test it on real people's data, on real personal information. Let's test it for 60 to 90 days. But no, that is not what I said. That is not what the memo alludes to. When we do security testing, we don't do it uh, in terms of using live people's data. We, use, well, we do security would, testing in a pre-implementation environment. Prior right, well, I would contend we are beyond pre-implementation. We are testing this in the real market and it is failing. You said uh, that the format of this ATO is not typical. Is that true? It is true. And, and so you have never seen that sort of format before. Is it a problem that you were not given the final security control assessment prior to uh, authoring the ATO, the authorization to I don't, operate? I don't think that's necessarily a problem because my staff were, con uh, were um, copied on it. But you, didn't, do, but you didn't get to see it. You said, actually, I didn't get a copy of the final SCA. That, those are your words. Because, because I was with 
the uh, information system security officer in Herndon when these tests were being conducted, and um, and it was determined that was there were the, no high findings. As the person with responsibility for the authorization operate, I think you should have been at your desk reading the final security control assessment. And if one was, I, I was there in person. This, but I'm glad to see that you covered yourself by putting this sentence in here. Are any among I, I didn't. Are, that was not to cover myself. That was a decision memo uh, between I Jim Kerr you. and I. Are any among you today willing to bet your job that uh, thousands of people's personal data won't be released because of the implementation of this website? That's certainly a there, yes or no question. That's a, a yes or no question. Yeah. Would you would you attest Let to me, that? I, what, I, you, you know that they are trying to ask us to predict something what? that security vulnerabilities I'm, are are uh, as some folks have mentioned before. It happens every day. That's I'm, why we do security testing. So obviously, from from the documents here, you weren't comfortable with this. You were trying to transmit to your no, boss it, that. It, let me just read your words again. This constitutes a risk that must be accepted and mitigated to support the marketplace day one operations. In other words, to launch this thing by October first. You were telling your boss she is going to have to accept some risks that are not normal for this. Uh, I did want to if get you, into numbers, you, but uh, just very briefly. You, the, quickly, the gentleman's time is okay. expired. Uh, Mr. Park, we have got uh, Mr. Chow says 17,000 users a minute, or I am sorry, an hour can subscribe. And we have got uh, Mr. Langford, who has been waiting for over an hour and a half. We have five orders of magnitude difference between those two numbers. Which is closer to the truth? Uh, the gentleman may answer. How many people? How many people an hour are, are able to enroll in health care? Uh, so you, the, you must know this. He, uh, the gentleman previously said seventeen thousand. Is that correct? Seventeen thousand registrations for new accounts per hour is the number that we have. I imagine you've got a war room somewhere where you're directing these operations, and you've got some big number. The only number that matters. How many are enrolling? How many are enrolling right now per hour? Can you tell us? Uh, so actually, what the war room tracks? Just a number. Come on. We both love numbers. I'll let the gentleman answer. Your time has expired, please. Uh, it, so, it's a Harvard MIT problem, I think. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk more afterwards. Um, uh, in terms of enrollment numbers, those are going to be released by the administration shortly. I thank the gentleman. We now go to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Cartwright. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, the Affordable Care Act was passed into law in 2010, and it seeks to increase competition in the marketplace to help bring down health care costs. The law it ends the practice of denying coverage to those with preexisting conditions, bans, annual and lifetime limits on health care benefits. It also enables parents to keep their children on health care until they are 26 years old, and it makes small businesses eligible for tax credits to ease the burden of employee coverage. The law also works to strengthen Medicare and will make prescription coverage for seniors more affordable. Now, these tax credits are desperately needed in my district, where nearly 9.4 percent of my constituents live below the poverty line. 70,000, that is 10.5 percent, do not have health insurance in my district, including 6,500 children. And they will be able to utilize the subsidies offered under the Affordable Care Act finally to get health care. Now, I also want to get to the bottom of what is going on with this website, healthcare.gov, and I support oversight hearings for that purpose. However, this hearing, like so many previous hearings this committee has held, is clearly an extension of the politically motivated repeal or delay agenda that some of my friends on the other side of the aisle have been pushing since this law was first passed in 2010. It seems to me that if the chairman really were so worried about getting this website fixed so that people could actually access affordable health care, uh, he would not have subpoenaed, subpoenaed Mr. Park to come in and testify today. In fact, Mr. Park agreed to testify before this committee just two and a half weeks later. Uh, but the chairman refused that offer and subpoenaed him anyway. And the chairman's subpoena, combined with the constant leaking of partial transcripts, taking witnesses' quotes out of context, seems like it is part of a predetermined political strategy rather than a constructive effort to con conduct responsible oversight, as this committee is supposed to do. In fact, although the chairman claimed otherwise in his opening statement here today, the House Republican Conference is politicizing this issue. And here is the proof. They have issued a playbook 
to Republican members, they actually call it that, a playbook right on the cover of the thing, and it doesn't say how to fix problems with the website or improve the process uh, or work to ensure Americans with health care. It tells them how to exploit any challenges or glitches for their own political gain. I'm not just saying, all, I'm, not, I'm not saying all Republicans are doing this, uh, but it certain, certainly seems to me in this form uh, that the chairman of this committee is. Uh, would, the, would the gentleman like to place that in the record? Because I haven't seen it. Yes. Without objection, so ordered. It is my hope that we can have oversight without this kind of gamesmanship and partisan politics, as this committee has been able to do in the past. So I really would like to get to the bottom of what's going on with the website, because I want my constituents to be able to sign up for quality, affordable health care. Now, Mr. Chow, uh, on November 7, Chairman Issa uh, issued a press release with the headline, quote, ACA testing bulletin, healthcare.gov could only handle 1,100 users day before launch, unquote. He then accused Jay Carney and Mr. Park of making false statements to the American people by suggesting that officials estimated capacity at about 60,000. That is what the chairman said, and I quote, Jay Carney is being paid to say things that aren't so, but in this case, Todd Park and other people who knew the facts, who had to know the facts, and the facts were from documents we received from lead co contractors that slowed down to an unacceptable level at 1,100 users. Well, in fact, Todd Park was telling us that at 60,000 was the target, and at 250,000, they just couldn't handle it, unquote. As the basis for that allegation, the chairman quoted from a testing document that he released, which says this, and I quote from the document, quote, ran performance testing overnight in IMP1B environment, work, working with CGI to tune the FFM environment to be able to ha handle maximum load. Currently, we are able to reach 1,100 users before response time gets too high. And Mr. Chow. It is my understanding that the IMP1B environment was only a sample testing environment, not a test of the full production capacity of the entire website. Am I correct in that? Uh, the gentleman's time has expired, but the gentleman may answer. You are correct. Uh, the imp, imp, what we call implementation 1B environment is about 10 percent the size of the full production environment. Thank you. Yield back. I thank you. We now go to the gentleman, Mr. Meadows. And Mr. Meadows, would you yield for just 10 seconds for a comment? Certainly, Mr. Chairman. You know, I never could quite understand how this thing could handle 60,000 simultaneous users, but only do six in a day. So maybe, maybe unlike some of the smart people here, I just don't get it that six in a day doesn't seem like 60,000 simultaneous users. I thank the gentleman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank each one of you for coming to testify. Uh, and Mr. Park, uh, you are not old enough probably to remember this, but uh, I was remember the $6 million man. You are now the $600 million man because you are coming in to fix uh, all this. And so we are hopeful that you, based on the people that I represent, that you are successful uh, by November 30th. Uh, we do want to ask you, though, how do we define success? Because uh, the, the talking points are all that it is going to be fixed for the vast majority of Americans as they go on. And we see Mr. Lankford here. He can't get on. So what is success? Is it a 98 percent uh, without wait time? What, what, how do we define success? So on December 1st, we will know whether you are worth $600 million or not. Uh, so thank you for your thank you for your comments and your question. Uh, so first of all, you know, I'm just a small part of the team working to fix this. So um, uh, so what's success? So success uh, is well. First of all, the site will most definitely not be perfect, right? Um, so e even sites that are mature uh, that are running really well. I know, but how do you when when the president asks you were you successful? How do you define success? Um, so uh, you first of all want a system that is stable. Right, so it's actually up and running consistently, uh, as opposed to what percentage of the time? Um, so ninety-eight percent of the time. Well, the, 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 one one proxy that we are using actually uh, is uh, uh, for just performance in general uh, is response time uh, and uh, error rate. Uh, 
Uh, and if the system actually has issues and goes down, then actually uh, these things can, can, uh, can then exacerbate okay. uh, those well, I'm, I'm going to run out of time. So what I would ask you to do is, for the record, is get to committee what we can look to so that we can disseminate it to all of America on what success is so on December 1st we will all know. I will Instead take that back. Absolutely. All right. All right, thank you. Mr. Chow, uh, much of your testimony is, I have read some of your testimony and it seems to be a little different, but I, I also know that you had several meetings, uh, ongoing meetings with White House staff uh, over this process. Is that correct? I accompanied uh, Marilyn Tavner and um, other um, uh, directors such as Gary Cohen. And so how many times were you at the White House? Uh, over the course of three years, maybe um, less than two dozen times. Okay, because the, the logs suggest 29 times. Is that correct? That is Would that be in the ballpark. That might not be accurate because some meetings were canceled. Okay, who conducted these meetings? Was uh, it Jean it Lamborn? Jean Lamborn? Uh, I believe her name is pronounced Lambrew. Uh, okay. There, there were meetings uh, conducted by her. Also, uh, I have met with Steve Van Roekel. Um, as well as uh, in, in those meetings. So you all were all no, no, part uh, of those meetings? No, Steve chaired a. Uh, no, I am asking about the White House meetings. So there was 29 White House meetings of which you had this group. Who all were, who was, who were the people in the room? Um, were you in there? I, I don't, I am not trying to be difficult, but there are different parts of the White House. There is a White House Conference Center. In okay, the meetings with. Jean, uh, that she was leading, the 29 meetings, mm, that or two probably, dozen? That was probably less than a handful. Okay. Um, I guess my question is, I am a little confused how the President would be surprised that this was such a debacle on October 1st. If you all were meeting regularly with the White House, why would they be surprised on October 1st? that it didn't roll out the way I, that everybody thought it should? I think the subject matter, at least uh, with, uh, with my attendance uh, being there, was to discuss things such as the status of the hub development. Um, so did anybody out. express concern that there was a problem, that October 1st there was going to be a problem? No. There was no one in that room. that So we had there, all there the were, brightest highly, minds in the world in this they, room, and no one anticipated were, a problem on October 1st. They were highly specific issues, such as working on uh, 6103 requirements with IRS, <laughs> Privacy Act implementation with the SSA. They are very operationally specific implementations. So you all weren't meeting on how the website was going to no, work, not, none of you? Not, Meetings. No, the, my meetings were more operationally and uh, focused about implementation. All right. So, so it is plausible that the president would be surprised that this wasn't going to work, based on those meetings. I wouldn't know that. Okay. So, who who uh, who would have been in the best position to be able to advise the president that we were going to have this just unmitigated mess? Anybody in that room? I've Who should we bring back here, I guess is what I am saying, Mr. Chow, that can help the American people understand why this was such a fiasco? I, I really don't have an answer to that. It is amazing. Well, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. It is amazing how we can find, you know, how you can't answer a simple question for the American people. I don't think that is for, for me to decide. That is why I am not. I, I, I asked the question. It is for you to answer. But, okay, so my answer is it is not really for me to decide. Mr. Meadows, uh, your time has expired, and I, I strongly suspect that, uh, as is often said in politics, that success has many fathers, quite a few mothers, plenty of relatives, but failure is an orphan. You are going to find an, an orphan here, if I have ever heard, heard or seen one. With that, the patient gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Lynch, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the members of the panel for coming forward and their willingness to help the committee with its work. Uh, I, I do want to say just at the outset that uh, my experience in Massachusetts with the Massachusetts health care, the so-called Romney care, uh, that was a precursor to this in many ways, uh, I am speaking of the Affordable Care Act, uh, also rolled out very, very, very slowly. Uh, that is my experience in being on the ground in Massachusetts when that plan went forward. So it was very slow in, in, in ramping up. Uh, of course, it didn't have the 
you know, the, uh, the urgency of this, this program, it was sort of planned that way. Uh, and I also remember the Medicare Part D Act, uh, which uh, was a Republican initiative, uh, also rolled out extremely slowly. And I know a lot of my seniors, I had to do 16 town halls uh, around my district to try to tamp down the, the, uh, the backlash because of the slowness of how that was ramped up. So this, is not, this experience is not uh, out of line with those other two programs. And so I just wanted to make that, make that note. I have had a chance to go out and, and talk to some of the outreach workers. Uh, a lot of the outreach on the Affordable Care Act in, in my district uh, is being conducted through the local community health centers. I have basically an urban district. So the health care, uh, excuse me, the health center employees are going out and signing people up. One of the, one of the concerns that they have raised is that, uh, that the Affordable Care Act is so, uh, so focused and, and uh, sort of facilitated by an email address. People have to have an email address in order to interact with this whole thing. And if you look at the demographic of the 31 million people who were trying to get health care to that were, that were not receiving health care before, uh, the poor, the elderly, that's, exact, that's a high correlation between folks who didn't get health care before and don't have an email. And so the outreach workers, when I said, what's your biggest problem, they said, well, when we're working with the elderly, and we are working with low-income families, the poor, they don't have an email address. And the system we got is basically it requires an email address. And to do otherwise, to get to that, you know, to scratch that itch, we are gonna, we're gonna have to somehow close that gap because a lot of these folks don't have email addresses, and yet they are the very people that we are trying to get health care to. So has any, any thought been given to, uh, look, this was supposed to be the easy part, okay, getting people up on the grid. I am not talking about making health care affordable or high quality health care or making sure access is there, just getting them up on the grid. This was supposed to be the easy part. So I am concerned. I am concerned about where we are today and where we need to get to in order to, uh, to, to meet any uh, definition of success. So what are we doing about those people who don't have an email address because they are poor or elderly, they are they're, they're, they're not on the grid? How are we going at them? Anybody got an idea? We do operate call centers. We have 12 call centers in which uh, uh, people can work with a live person online to uh, fill out the application and to uh, go through their determination process and to uh, select the plan and get enrolled. The, the application, though, at least the, the workers I talked to said it is like 31 or 34 pages. Um, you are going to go through a 34-page application for, on, on the phone? I think what happens, the, the, the call center experience is not really, you are necessarily filling out a paper application. It can, you can start that way and submit it that way, but I think you can also start with a call center representative. Yeah. Well, I'm not so sure that that's working. That might be part of our problem. I have a district where I have, you know, a lot of seniors, a lot of folks that are struggling. So uh, we got to we got to figure that one out. We can, uh, we can certainly <clears throat> confirm that uh, that process or that procedure. And yeah, that'll help. Get it back to you. Uh, the other the other situation is this: uh, at at the same time that we're trying to get this up and get people on the grid, we have employers that are making decisions not to continue health care plans for their employees. So they are unplugging and they are sending people to the exchanges. So I got employers out there, a lot of them in the construction industry, that are saying, I know I used to provide health care for you, but, but now I want you to go to the exchanges and get them through. So they are unplugging. They're, they used to provide health care. And, and now these employees in the construction industry are trying to plug in and they are having, they're having these problems. And, I, and I'm wondering, is, is, there, is there any way to sort of uh, make sure that that unplugging doesn't occur until we have a, 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 a platform that we're, we're confident people can plug into? Because I think there's going to be a gap here, and uh, it's, uh, it concerns me greatly that we have so many people in the construction industry 
um, that are, and I have met with union employers, about 50 union employers and about 35 non-union are open shop employers that both have the same problem. And uh, I think there is just a mismatch in what is going on here where, where the employers are disengaging and saying, sending their employees to, to the exchanges, and when they try to go to the exchanges, they are having problems signing up. And I am wondering if there is some corrective action that we might be able to take, either delaying the, the, you know, the uh, process for, for employers to disengage or um, just giving people time to, to hook into the system that is, quite, is, is not ready for prime time. The gentleman's time has expired. You may answer. Uh, if the gentleman would yield just briefly. Sure. I, I was hoping you would suggest the question of can't we do this by mail? <laughs> that's, a, that's an inside joke. No, but, but in all seriousness, the fact is that if somebody is, doesn't have email capability, why couldn't they make a call to a call center, receive those many pages, fill out those pa that paperwork, return it in a self-addressed stamp envelope uh, so that, in fact, mm. the post office could ensure that the elderly people not comfortable with email and so on Well, it's it just my thoughts, and I, I won't take longer time than you did, but I know that just generally we are trying to get away from a paper process. And so I suppose as a last resort it might be, it might be necessary, but it's not, not the ideal. No, I certainly not. Uh, Can I just I yield back. answer that? It, we're, it's not a really a we're not considering that as a last resort because paper is uh, a little inefficient. But we do a comp make accommodation which, if you want to start the process in paper, you can, and then mail it into our eligibility support worker contract, which will then take you through the rest of the process. I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chow. And with that, we go to the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Mosh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I am going to yield my time to my friend, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Jordan. The gentleman from Ohio is recognized, and without objection, the gentleman from Ohio will be able to control the time. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Um, Mr. Park, uh, Mr. Meadows asked the pertinent question. Um, there were a series of meetings held at the White House, um, weekly meetings that um, were presided over by folks in the White House. Mr. Meadows asked, who are those people who need to come in front of this committee who can answer the questions? The questions like, why didn't you know that the security assessment wasn't completely done in, in testing? Well, who, who can answer the questions about why you decided to go ahead and launch this on October 1st? And we know who that person is because according to the Washington Post story, November 2nd, a memo that they got from David Cutler spells it out. Mr. Cutler said, we need to put someone from the private sector in charge, someone who has run a business, someone who has that kind of experience and expertise. And the President said, no, he would already, according to the article, already made up his mind, Nancy Ann DeParle is that person. So that is the person we need, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Cutler also points out, Mr. Meadows referenced this as well, according to the memo, the overall head of implementation inside HHS was Gene Lambrew. So those are the two people we need. Would you agree, Mr. Park, they need to come here and tell us what took place, why these decisions were made, why it was done the way it was done? These are the two key people? I mean, this is the guy, this is the lady the President said, no, that's who I want in charge. Even though Peter Orzag, Larry Summers, Zeke Emanuel, and David Cutler said, put someone else in charge, the President says, no, I want Nancy Ann DeParle in charge. Don't you think she should come in front of this committee, Mr. Park? Uh. Respectfully, I can't really speak to that, sir. No, I know. We are probably going to have to do the same thing for her that we did for you. We will have to subpoena them because yesterday, last week, the Chairman and I sent a letter to the White House asking that simple question. Would Ms. DeParle, the person handpicked by the President to run this operation, would she come in front of this committee and testify about this disaster this rollout has been? And would Ms. Lambro come as well? And the response we got back yesterday from the White House was, thank you for inviting us, but we are not coming. So it looks like we're going to have to do the same thing, Mr. Chairman, that we had to do with Mr. Park to get the two key people to come here. Now, according to White House logs, Mr. Chow, you testified you'd been there between 10 and 29 times to these meetings. And Mr. Park, according to the White House log, you'd been to nine of these where Gene Lambrew ran, ran the meeting. Is that correct, Mr. Park? Nine times you went to the White House where Ms. Lambrew ran these weekly meetings? I, I can't verify that. That um, is what the visitor's log says. Were you, in meetings, were you in meetings with Nancy Ann DeParle and Jean Lambro at the White House? Uh, from time to time, yes. 
And was, was the, and, and of course the meetings were about the rollout of the Affordable Care Act and the website? Uh, as I recall, there were different kinds of meetings, uh, and I attended. Uh, were they about from time Obamacare, to time. Mr. Park? Uh, were they, they were about the Affordable Care Act. Right, and you're the IT. What's your official title? You're head of information information technology for the entire United States. That's your title. So I assume it was about information technology, correct? Uh, no, actually. So first of all, uh, I'm a technology and innovation policy advisor in the Office of Science and Technology Policy. So I'm not the head of IT for the U.S. government. Okay. Just to clarify. Um, and um, uh, uh, I, I can't actually recall, like for the meetings, like what particular topics were discussed, like off the top of my head. So unless there's more specificity, did at any time in these nine different meetings you had, or more for that matter, meetings you had, was it was the rollout of Obamacare discussed and the concerns about this thing not being ready on October first? Uh, Again, again, without kind of more specificity about Mr. Chow, in these meetings, was, who ran the meetings that you had the 10 to 29 times you were at the White House? Who was, who was in charge of running the meetings then? Were any of those meetings run by Ms. Lambrew or Ms. DeParle? I don't think it was 29 times. Um, you said you testified between 10 and 29. So, whatever the number is, in those meetings you were at the White House, were any of those run by Jean Lambrew or Nancy Ann DeParle? Uh, one was run by Nancy Ann, and one, uh, just a couple I attended that was with Jean Lambrew. Um, and as I mentioned before, is about um, my role was to, to provide a five minute status on uh, hub development. Um, but I don't think, you know, it was. I'm not worried so much about your role. I just want to, to establish the fact that you were at the White House between 10 and 29 times, Mr. Park was there nine times. Mr. Van Runkle, how many times were you in these weekly meetings at the White House? Uh, I don't recall. I don't, didn't attend any weekly meetings associated. Were you in any meetings with Jean Lambro or Nancy Ann DeParle? I have been in the company of those two people. Yes. Regarding the Affordable Care Act? Uh, maybe once or twice. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I, my time has expired, but those are the two people, those are the individuals that need to come in front of this committee, and we can't accept the fact that we got a letter from the White House that says uh, thank you, but we are not coming. I thank the gentleman. I would note for all members that there is a vote on on the floor. We are going to go until the very last minute. Uh, I know what I would ask is if there, if Ms., uh, Mr. Bentivilio or Mr. Mrs. Loomis, if do you, either of you have specific questions for Mr. Park? I do not. Then, Mr. Park, because we would otherwise keep you for longer than I think is necessary, I want to thank you for being here. I apologize to the other witnesses. You get to stay. Uh, at, through the, uh, the vote. But, Mr. Park, uh, you have been a very cooperative witness. I appreciate your being here. I believe you are being here as the person we are going to look to to get this right by November 30th. It was critical. I appreciate your being here. And uh, without objection, you are dismissed. Is there just, just one more request? Of course. Would someone send me contact info for Congressman Langford, just so I can find uh, out? We will there? have that contact information given to you. I, I will do one other thing quickly. Uh, if when you go back, since you are a Federal employee, go to the FEHBP website, and you, what you will find there in a PDF form is a spreadsheet. Now, Mr. Chow seems to think that, uh, that it was not important to give people a shopping list, but I will tell you, if you are a Federal employee, postal or non-postal, you can go to that website, you can look at every single plan, and it will tell you how much the annual rate is, the biweekly rate, how much your government pays for you, and how much you will pay by plan. Now, that doesn't let you endlessly look at the details of the plan, but for 230-plus plan, plans spend, spread over not just federal 50 states, but the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico, we provide this to the Federal workforce. I might suggest that if you can't get some form of legitimate open uh, shopping list up quickly that currently telling people what their rate is if they are 27 or 50 is disingenuous because it distorts what the real rates are and that a splash page like this or a PDF so people could look at all the plans and by age, depending upon what their age is, they would know what the rate is could be done in a matter of hours uh, by a tenth grader, and that might suffice until this uh, uh, can I make program a is available. Can I make available. a comment really quick? 
In my uh, oral uh, remarks, I mentioned that we are working on a premium estimation tool that will uh, give you more details than just the very coarse uh, under 49, over 50, so that you can browse uh, plans. We are working on that. Right. right. But understand, you are under 50 is 27. You are over 50 is 50. That misstates because it is age-based. It misstates the, the true. If you were picking it, you should have picked 64 and 29, and you would have gotten much higher rates if you are going to give anecdotal. But the truth is, a simple spreadsheet that Microsoft in, uh, forget about Microsoft, SuperCalc could have given you that spreadsheet uh, before many of my staff were born, and that could be made available very quickly. So I might suggest that the American people deserve to know that a plan based on their age is X amount, and a free look would be very helpful, and I, I commend you to look at FEHBP and what we do for ourselves as Federal employees. Uh, and with that, I am going to go to the gentleman from Michigan. I believe we have time. Ben Tavilio. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, are you familiar with uh, Brooks Law? Anybody? Brooks Law? It's the first thing you learn in software development. You need to divert developers to training new developers you added to the project, which kind of tells me that uh, November 30th rollout is another hope and a dream. Are you familiar? Any read this? Uh, Information technology, critical factors underlying successful major ac acquisitions, dated October 2011, nine best practices. Did you read it? I think I have perused it. Oh, good. Good. So you are familiar with, um, well, you perused it. You didn't study it. Apparently you didn't. Uh, I was busy working on uh, the marketplace program, so I don't have a whole lot of time to read a lot of um, other materials. Yeah. How about, uh, are you familiar with, with this uh, fix that you are putting in for Obamacare? Um, you are diverting people that understand the software to train people that additional help to come in and fix the problem? Yes, I think that is uh, what is happening now. You think? Okay. Yeah. You know, um, I will see. One of the th I am going to list three. Program officials, three of the nine best practices, essential to IT, which you did not implement. Program officials were actively engaged with stakeholders. Obamacare rollout apparently lacked senior oversight from most senior technology officials, including Federal CIO, Federal CTO, and HHS CIO. Mr. Power, what are some? Uh, what should we take from this report, Mr. Power? Powner. Yeah, well, clearly those are best practices. What, what we did, that was a report that we did, would, we always report on failures. So we actually went to 10 agencies and we asked them for a success story. So there are seven successful acquisitions in there and we asked why they were successful. None of that is a surprise. It is defining your projects right up front, putting the right people in charge, good communications with contractors and managing best practices throughout the life cycle. So, uh, it is something everyone at this table knows needs to be done on successful acquisitions. And, you know, Mr. Chairman, I think FATARA and where we look at the acquisition process and the whole bit, that is fine. We're, that's going to be very helpful. But a lot of this just gets down to solid governance and good management and the right attention on these projects. And that is what those practices really uh, highlight. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to yield the rest of my time to the, uh, Mr. Meadows. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. Recognize. I thank the gentleman from uh, Michigan, and I have a question. I've, I've been running the numbers, and, and yeah. my understanding is is we're creating this site to create a, a system that uh, is available for seventeen thousand users per hour. Is that correct? The way it was described is that the first part of the process is you have to register for an account. So right. that's, um, that current capacity is running at 17,000 registrations per hour. So what are we building the system to be able to handle in terms of capacity? 17,000 or higher than that? It is approximately 48 to 58,000 users in the system. Uh, by that, I mean um, you could be on the learn side just looking at static web pages to actually uh, actively uh, filling out an application. I guess, what is the smallest end of the conduit? I mean, what truly, is it 17,000, 25,000, or 43,000? I mean, what is what's our smallest 
uh, ability in terms of volume to handle in terms of capacity? Uh, I think right now there is about, on average, somewhere between 22 to 25,000. So that's what we are building the capacity to 25,000? Per hour, it is uh, it's sitting right around that. And that is what we are building it to, that is the specs? Uh, actually, a little ex exceeding that. We, uh, like, for example, the front part, the identity management part, where uh, we are going to uh, apply some improvement that is going to go to 30,000 registrations per okay, hour. Let me, let me tell you the reason why I ask. I have done the numbers. If you take the number of uninsured Americans that are out there, and if, if they got on the system today, 24 hours a day, which we know doesn't happen, it would be 43,000 people an hour. So we are building a system that won't even take care of the uninsured people that we have right now. So how are we, we going to be successful? Uh, I like to look at your calculations and how you spend. 50 million people, you can do it over the next 48 days. Um, I don't think the estimates were. I know the estimates weren't there, but if you do the math, that's what works. I yield back. I thank the gentleman, and, and I am sorry that you have to look at his figures, that, in fact, the burn rate necessary to get done wasn't, wasn't understood from day one, and the surge requirement at 4.30 in the afternoon or 5.30 in the afternoon uh, Pacific time wasn't, in fact, what you were looking at, because I know Mr. Van Roca would understand that you need two or three or four times the highest capacity to deal with when people actually are going to log on and try to do it. Uh, Ms. Loomis is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chow, you said that NIST defines high risk as a vulnerability that could be expected to have a severe or catastrophic adverse effect on individuals or organizational operations or assets. I want to focus on the part about the severe or catastrophic adverse effect on individuals. Is it true that there were two high risks? that continue to be found related to the marketplace information systems, but you weren't told about them at the time? I think you are referring to the September 3rd uh, uh, authorization to operate. In I, am. I am. Uh, those two uh, findings were, I think, earlier in the hearing today, we uh, clarified that that was dealing with two components of the marketplace systems that deal with uh, plan submitting dental and health plan information, qualified health plan, and didn't involve any personally identifiable information. The, the memo I have is redacted, so it doesn't, I don't have the information that you just testified to because of the redactions in the memo. So maybe that is correct, maybe that it, it's not. Are you testifying that that is absolutely what it's about? Y yes, because I saw an unredacted version that was handed by committee staffers to me uh, last week, and if it's been redacted, it's been redacted by someone else. Did one of the risks outlined in this memo pertain to the protection of financial or privacy data? Uh, I don't have it right in front of me. I think there was, there was an appendix section, um, but I don't recall seeing that. So you don't know whether financial and privacy data were outlined as a risk in this memo? I don't believe so, because it dealt with our, um, our plan management or our qualified health plan um, submission module, which are data that's submitted by issuers and uh, dental providers. Is it true that the internal memo, this memo, outlined one of these risks as the threat and risk potential are limitless? Um, no, I think it's referring to a very specific type of risk when you allow a upload of a file that has an internal macro that runs, but it's not about people. This is not personally identifiable information. It's what is it about? It's uh, plans submitting uh, their um, their network adequacy. Uh, it's basically uh, worksheets that contain uh, information about the benefit data that each uh, issuer submits. Okay. I'm going to switch gears. Mr. Chow, did you brief White House officials prior to October 1st about the status of the website? No, not directly about the website. Who did? I don't know. Mr. Bateman, did you? I did not. Mr. Van Rokel, did you? Uh, not only do I not know that that happened, I, I don't know. 
and I did not. You, when Mr. Jordan asked you some questions, one of the things that he asked you was uh, about your involvement in meetings. He was specifically re referencing um, Mrs. or Ms. I'm looking for the name. Were any? Well, let me just ask you this: Were any of the meetings you attended at the White House? Uh, it, it depends how you describe the White House. I we, uh, the White House includes Treasury, the old Executive Office Building, the new Executive Office Building, and the White House proper at a minimum. I didn't know if you were talking about physical or organizational. So I'm organizational. I'm in, in every case. I, I work in an agency uh, that okay. is part of the Executive Office of the President. So. Every meeting I have is considered sort of part of the of that organization. And was uh, Ms. I, I, Lambro present? As I mentioned in my answer to Mr. Jordan, in one to two uh, meetings, yes. And what were those meetings about? Those particular meetings were dealing with. Uh, they were asking actually my private sector advice on demand generation and marketing to young people. How to use social media to reach out to uninsured Americans. So. <clears throat> Who was briefing the White House about the uh, status of the website? No one? Did no one brief the White House about the status of the website before October 1st? Mr. Chow? Not me personally, but um, our, our administrator, Marilyn Tavner, certainly um, is representing the agency, so uh, you might want to ask her. So we don't know whether the status of the Federal Exchange and the Data Hub were ever a focus of meetings between White House and HHS personnel before I October think, 1st? I think in what I said earlier that in the meetings I attended, I provided status briefings on the progress of certain IT builds like uh, the Data Services Hub. And your reports on the status of the builds set off alarm bells with them? No, because the Data Services Hub was actually um, uh, performing well and on time, and, uh, and it received its authority to operate in August. Okay. So what happened between August and October 1st? Um, I didn't attend any White House meetings. What happened with the performance of the Hub? Uh, the Hub is doing fine. It's, uh, it's doing what it's intended to do. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank them. I will be brief. Uh, Mr. Chow, the EIDM, or what I call the front door, is what didn't perform well. Isn't that true? Correct. And since the, system the, was designed, the since the system was designed so that you had to go through the front door to get anything else, it doesn't really matter if you had 60,000, 600,000, or 60 million capability. If the American people had to go through that front door and only six got to the end, we can presume that the number that existed just prior to launch of 1,100 in that so-called minimized test, or as you said, it was only one-tenth the amount, uh, really wasn't true. The truth is that when people got timeouts as they tried to register, as they tried to go through the EIDM, uh, the marketplace hub, one that you forced them through by, in September, determining that they could not look at a splash page to get a price idea if nothing else was available, that front door being blocked is essentially the reason that the American people have wasted, for the most part, a month trying to get registered. Isn't that true? No, it's not true. Yeah, well, it is. Mr. Uh, Mr. Bateman, where were you, since you, you and Mr. Van Roekel are critically part of this process? Where were you, and Mr. Park was brought in afterwards, where were you in the months and years leading up to this? Why is it that you were not aware that on day one this product was going to fail to launch in any legitimate, acceptable way? As I indicated in my opening testimony, HHS is a federated agency. The job for running Okay, not, not your job. This is an orphan. Mr. Van Roekel, you came out of the private sector. Bill Gates and Steve Ballmer and a lot of other people at Microsoft would have had somebody's neck hung, maybe not literally and maybe not fired them, but they would want to know, demand to know. Steve Jobs, when he was alive over at Apple or in Next and the other programs, they would have said, who the blank is responsible for this failure? Can you tell me today 
whose job it was to make sure that we didn't have this dreadful failure to launch that didn't call the one person that should have known and didn't do their job? One person. Who was that person? As I said earlier, I, you know, I wasn't close to the actual development or coding. Okay, I was, so, I'm not in a position to make Okay, so I had you, I had Mr. Park, Mr. Bateman, and Mr. Chow. We will leave the GAO out of it because we are going to probably ask them and others to help us find out. But none of you today can tell us who failed to do their job. And as a result, the American people lost a month of any effective, real ability to sign up. This website was dead at launch for all practical purposes. And I am sorry, Mr. Chow, but you can give me all the numbers you want. Six on the first day, 240 on the second day, when millions of Americans were trying to make this work. We may disagree on, on, on Obamacare, but we don't disagree that that was unacceptable. You heard it on both sides of the aisle. Mr. Van Roko, I think you failed to understand, you and Mr. Bateman and all of you in the administration who were allowed to go to those meetings, Mr. Uh, Pauner would tell you that best practices should be a lot more like it is at Toyota Company uh, or Honda. In the production line, one person who sees a bad car coming down is allowed to stop the production line. In this case, a really defective, something that would make the Etzel look like a success story, launched on October 1st, and nobody said here today, or for that matter, since I have been listening to the various hearings, nobody said, I should have pulled the stop button. Mr. Chow, you refuse to answer or give a grade. Mr. Bateman, you refuse to answer or give a grade. Mr. Van Roko, you refuse to answer to give a grade. Well, I am going to give it a grade. This was an F. Or on a pass-fail, this was a fail. Every one of you should have been close enough to know there was something wrong to ask somebody in one of those many meetings, are we sure this is going to work, and at least get an assurance from somebody that it, that it would. Mr. Pounder, I want to thank you for being here today, because you are, although many people have talked about FATARA and, and what we need to do in legislation, you are the only person here that represents an organization that has said there is a right way to do it. We have looked at agencies of the Federal Government who have done it right. And like you, we normally look at the agencies that fail. We look at the program uh, out of Wright Pat that failed and lost us a billion dollars. We are looking at a failure that cost the American people millions of their hours frustrated trying to get online to check on whether or not health care is going to be more affordable for them. So I look forward to all of you being part of the process of best practices in your job going forward. But I look also with all of you realizing that without legislative change, we will be back here again with everybody saying, I, I didn't fail to do my job even when a product failed to launch. And with that, you are dismissed. We will set up the next panel for after the vote.